Hi, I'm Ryan Davis. And I'm Kiernan Schmidt. And this is Out of Office, a travel podcast. This seat taken. Hey, Kiernan. God bless America, Ryan. Ah, uh, what a what a week to celebrate uh, this great country of ours. Happy Fourth of July. Happy Fourth of July. Uh, how are you going to uh, planning on spending it? I'm going to be with my dear friend Joe, who did the theme song for this podcast, up in Beacon, and his family. They're going to have a, a barbecue, and there's going to be fireworks. It's going to be very, uh, very, very patriotic. That that's very fitting because uh, for today's podcast, in honor of the Fourth of July, you and I, two great patriots. Are, are going to talk about our favorite patriotic places to visit in the U.S. of A. Well, so I thought that the uh, the question that you posed to me was, what are the places that tell the best American story? That's right. I don't want, I don't want, because uh, that that's a certain, that's at the heart of patriotism, right? What makes America exceptional? And I thought, well, rather than just do kind of a list of, uh, you know, you could visit here, you could visit here. My question is, you had somebody come to you, Ryan, and say, I, I, I have an uh, open budget, open time. What are five places that I could visit to understand this complex, developing American story? And so you and I have each created a list of five, and we're going to compare and contrast. I haven't seen yours. You haven't seen mine. Uh, it's no, true. Totally. I mean, th- this could be, these could, we could have five of the same things. We get a five entirely different things. It, it, this could really go either way. I don't know how you're going to approach this. I just know that I've approached it in 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 uh, uh, both a patriotic and a thoughtful way. That I, I I'm anxious to hear it. I can feel that the listeners too are anxious to hear it. Um, but f- before we take off and get directly into the list, uh, I ha- I do have a quick topic I was hoping to to just pick your brain on for just a moment, if if you're willing. Sure. Oh, fantastic. Uh, so I've, I've been on a lot of planes recently. I've been traveling a lot for work. Mm-hmm. I had that, had that vacation that I recently got back from. And to the Pacific Northwest. To the Pacific Northwest. We covered that, I think. Yeah, no, we're not, gonna, <laughs> we're not looking backwards. And, uh, um, I, you know, I, it made me realize something that I haven't mentioned on the show before is that uh, when I'm on a flight, there are actually a few television shows that I have cordoned off. I will only watch them when I'm on a plane. And it made me realize somehow we have gotten 39 episodes deep without ever talking about what you and I watch on a plane. So what we actually watch on a plane. Gr- that was a great job repeating <laughs> back. <laughs> no, I-, I mean, I don't, I don't watch that much. So, I mean, I, so uh, what, what is your question exactly? When you find yourself, uh, you know, stuck in that middle seat, and uh, all you have is the earphone jack to free your mind and spirit. And, uh, you know, maybe you're too tired to read. What is it that you will watch uniquely on a plane that you wouldn't watch when you're on the ground? So for me, for me, it's a, it would be about movies. So I would watch a kind of big budget, crowd-pleasing movie, like a superhero movie or a, a, big, a big action or romantic comedy. You know, that's very funny. Superhero movies, that's one of yeah. the ones that I, I, oh, I really will only watch those when I'm on a plane. So I end up watching, like, you know, Avengers Endgame on this, like, teeny tiny screen. <laughs> and it, it's meant to be this huge extravaganza, but I right. only ever see you know, uh, uh, Benedict Cumberbatch as Dr. Strange uh, w- when he's about 10 millimeters tall. Yeah, but you're so close to the screen, you know. It must, That's true. It, yeah. it, it, yeah. he, lo- he looks 10 feet tall to me. I, I do feel like maybe it's a lack of oxygen uh, when you fly, but your, your taste level sort of plummets. You, you know, know? <laughs> I've actually heard that, um, I've read that people are uh, more prone to tears when they are watching something on a plane. Because, really? Yeah, like your emotions are heightened when you are heightened. That, that there's, there's something about the, the oxygen level and being um, closer to the yeah. ozone and your proximity to people, that your emotions are right at the edge. And I, that's true. I do find myself pretty teary, but I'm teary most of the time. I watched Coco on a plane. Ooh, but and Coco, Coco, fantastic. Coco's fantastic. Uh, and I just hadn't seen it. And I, oh, I, I, cry in, I, I embarrassed myself. Yeah. You know, uh, it was, it was one of my biggest public cry moments. The huge lagrimas. Yeah. Lagrimas grandes. Ah, muy bien, muy bien. <laughs> and uh, oh, this is a weird one. I, uh, I, it's, it's, a, it's a television show I actually really like. I have found that I like it. Uh, New Girl. New Girl starring Zoe Deschanel. Uh, I will only watch it on a plane because almost every flight has three episodes of it. 
And uh, it's just three random episodes. So I kind of know what happens at the beginning. I kind of know what happens to the end. I think there's like hundreds of episodes. And I- I'm confident that by the time I die, uh, and which I hope, by the way, is on a plane crash as I'm watching The New Girl. I, ho- I, hope, right. I-, I hope to achieve uh, having watched every single episode completely out of order. Well, I don't know that the I, I don't know the show that you're speaking of, but I can't imagine it's super plot heavy. No, it's uh, it's kind of like a Friends. It's got a kind right. of a Friends vibe. I, I, no, I no, no. Figured. It's, it's, a, that, so it's it's a network comedy. Yeah, it's a network yeah. comedy. Very kind of popcorn. Yeah, it's certainly does, nothing does, that I would like take. Does time. it take place in New York? Uh, it takes place in Seattle. Oh, so oh, I was going to say bringing it back to the Pacific Northwest. In fact, have you ever noticed that uh, a lot of these airlines now have like games and podcasts and like. All these kind of weird so, entertainment bits that, like, I can't imagine anyone ever actually using. So I, so in regards to entertainment bits, I have most definitely played the trivia game on Delta. Really? Yeah. Well, only like three people will play it. Yeah. And so it's easy. Oh, to are be, you playing against other passengers? This, I mean, there are several games, so I don't want to be misquoted here, but sure. there is definitely a Delta trivia game hmm. where you compete with other people on the plane. Uh-huh. And I'm always, uh, you know, I, I, I lead in that game. I'm very good in that game. I'm like the, uh, whatever that Jeopardy guy was. That's know, fascinating. I'm like I him. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the, one, the one who uh, beat, beat the record or the original guy? The, the, you know what? We don't know either of their names. No, Ken, Ken Jennings. I do know yeah, that. No, no, no. Yeah, Ken is a cool one. No, the other. I'm like, I'm like the other one. I'm almost, I'm almost the best. I'm sure. I'm sure that there are flights, Delta flights, that I have not been on where there's a guy or a gal who would dominate me at this game. Didn't the new guy beat Ken Jennings? Isn't that a thing? No, he just missed. It. Oh, he just missed. Okay. Yeah. Oh well, swing and a miss. I like Ken Jennings. I'm glad he's still on top. Uh, you know, Ryan, I would love to hear uh, from our listeners what how what you uh, is there anything that you uniquely do or or watch when you are trapped on an airplane that you find yourself more open to something that you would never do with your feet on the ground, uh, whether this trivia game. I'm sure that there are all sorts of odds and ends for those that have really delved deep into these entertainment experiences. So uh, you can let us know that at out of office pod at Gmail dot com. Yes, shoot us an email. Uh, you can also always reach us at the Instagram at OOO Podcast. Yeah, and actually I've noticed uh, we're getting some fan messages that, that come from direct messages on Instagram. You know, you could write much more substance at a full keyboard uh, if you go to that email address. Folks, it, folks, our DMs are open. Slide on in if you, <laughs> if you need to. I, that, I, is that what you say? Slide into the DMs? <laughs> Yes, that is what that you say. It sounds very you? sexual. I, it's I supposed very, to. I mean, I that's, feel, it, is, it, is a, it has a innuendo in it. Yeah. And of course, you can also reach us at our grinder handle. Ryan, what's your grinder <laughs> handle again? <laughs> uh, I, I don't, Grindr doesn't have handles. Uh, oh, does Grindr, you don't have names on Grindr? You have names, but there's no way to track. It's not like. Well, actually, gr- Grindr definitely has handles <laughs> from what oh. I've heard. Oh. <laughs> All right. Well, wow. uh, leaving off on that tasteful bit, Ryan, I, I think it's time for us to to um, put on our the last stop. Uh, I, I think it's t- <laughs> Ryan. I think it's time for us to to put on our our three cornered hats, uh, our George Washington uh, uh, wigs. I, I think it's time for us to uh, wrap ourselves in the flag and, and talk about patriotic places and, and and our competing lists of places to visit. All right, let's uh, let's take off and and uh, experience some of the American story. Tell the cabin crew. Flight attendants, prepare for takeoff, please. All right, Ryan. So, uh, just to, to reiterate, the challenge for today is instead of going through kind of a typical list of of you know five places that you could visit to celebrate America, uh, we, we've posed a question and we've each tackled it separately, and now we're going to compare and debate our lists. So the question was, with no limits to budget or time, if you had a visitor and maybe a non-American visitor come to you and say, I want to understand this vast, complex country of yours, the United States of America, send me to five places that will tell me the story of this great country. So I would suggest that we we each run down our list and, uh, and debate the merits uh, and and give the reasons why we've chosen the places that we have. And neither of us know who's on the other, uh, what's on the other person's list. No. So should we no. do one one at a time? I mean, okay, maybe we should make a guess. I, I would guess that if you've chosen five places, like four are in New York City and the third <laughs> is like in New Jersey, but close enough <laughs> that you could see it from Manhattan. 
Is that is that accurate? I do not have. Well, I know that one of them is in New York. City. Okay, one of mine is in New York City uh, too. All I right. bet they're I bet they're very different. Mm, yes, I bet you're right. I bet they are different. Now, here's one. How many of your places uh, are run by the National Park Service? Only two. Only two. How many do you think of mine are? Probably all five. I mean, you probably have a six or seventh you snuck in as like additional, which are <laughs> okay. also run by the National Park say, Service. I will say three are, and uh, the fourth incorporates some pieces that might be. Gotcha. That, that's, that's the description I'll give. And you said how many years? Only two? Only two are run by the National Park Service. All right. Service. Fascinating. How many museums do you have? Only one. Me too. Only one. Ah, interesting. N okay. And, uh, and uh, how many are on the East Coast? On the East Coast, I would say uh, three are on the East Coast. But three of mine are on the East oh Coast. Oh, my gosh. But, you know, I think that's to be expected because, you know, the East Coast is really where it all began. Right, right. But... Look, America had a sense of, of Western expansion manifest and, and manifest destiny. Absolutely. Absolutely. So it would be remiss of us not to talk about that in this in this episode. Absolutely. I, I completely agree. I, it really, it feel, I, I'm sensing that maybe we took a more similar approach than, than we might have guessed. Well, we'll see. We'll see. I'm excited to hear, uh, you know, how you played this out. All right. Would you like to go first or shall I? I'm going to go first. All right. Great. These are in three different sections uh, that when, I, when I give these out, sort of. Okay. So Five, the, five places, easily divisible by three. Perfect. <laughs> well, one of, them, one of them has its own section. So uh, the, first, the first thing, and I think this is incredibly important because it represents uh, a seismic shift in the story of the United States, is uh, the Lincoln Memorial. So hmm. I debated... Uh, doing other Lincoln related things. I yep. had, at one point I had seven Lincoln things and it yeah, was like, wait yeah. a minute, only supposed to be five. Yeah. Uh, whittled that down because I think the Lincoln Memorial uh, really says a lot about the country. It's sure. been the site of uh, obviously the, the March on Washington where Martin Luther King gave his famous speech, but it's also, uh, you know, a monument to I, who I believe is our greatest president mm -hmm. uh, in, in, a, in a time when America fulfilled part of its promise that it wasn't able to do in the, in the revolution by uh, finally getting rid of slavery. I, I uh, like it a lot. I've, I, uh, I also accomplished a, a Lincoln nod. But uh, in this was Lincoln Memorial was in consideration, but I felt that I could uh, grasp uh, just a little bit more than just him. But uh, continue, continue. Yeah. So, uh, you know, and, and, you know, there are uh, when you go to the Lincoln Memorial, you've got uh, speeches, some of his speeches that you can actually read. Um, and I think you get a real sense of, 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 of who he was as a man and the time he was going through. And plus, from the from the Lincoln Memorial, you can you can basically uh, you know look over the reflecting pool. Uh, so much of American history is actually, like I said, taken place there, um, and so many people have, have spoken there, and and so many iconic images have come out of that that you know just the area surrounding the Lincoln Memorial. That I think it's a it's a it's a good fit. I I agree that you you know we want to tell the broader story of of uh, the Civil War, um, but. It, for, for me, the Lincoln Memorial sort of brings it all together. Yeah, I no, I think it's a great choice. What so what is uh what's what's your first choice? Okay, I'm gonna kick off on the Freedom Trail here in Boston, uh, the cradle uh, of of the American right. civilization, as they call it. Does anyone right. call it that? No one calls it that. No. So uh, you're familiar with the Freedom Trail? I am. Yeah, the Freedom Trail. Uh, it's a great walking trail uh, through Boston. It's 2.5 miles long, brings you on uh, a bunch of official trail sites. I think there's 16 locations in the end. And in that 16 locations, you, you really gain a, a sense of the history of, of where the United States began. So it's very revolutionary war focused. So um, I, I will say there's a little bit of a cheat, right? Because I'm hitting a lot of good spots, right? You got the, yeah. you got Boston Common. You've got uh, the Massachusetts State House. You've got uh, the Ben Franklin statue here. Uh, the the uh, site of the Boston Massacre, uh, Faneuil Hall. I was disappointed to learn, you know, I explicitly said I wasn't going to recommend Paul Revere's house. And that but is Paul part Revere's of it? House, part, of, part of the tour. However, you yeah. do have to pay a separate uh, admission. So I'm just going to suggest, I'm going to send you on the Freedom Trail. Don't, don't worry about the Paul Revere house. You can see it from the outside. You get it. 
but saying the Freedom Trail is, is like if my first had been the National Mall, you know? Um, sure, I, I know. Which is I a do, good fit. I, which is, National Mall, by the way, a terrific place. You and I have probably been to every, you know, every monument and every statue of the National Mall many, many times. Absolutely, And yeah. you would get a good sense of America. But I, I, I tried to zero in, you know, just a little bit with my I understand, first choice. I understand. I, I went broad. You went yeah. narrow. Um, yeah. I get broader and, and, later, uh, I, Anna. I will say uh, uh, that the the Freedom Trail ends at at Bunker Hill, and that Battle of Bunker Bunker Hill, uh, I think was it was one of the first major battles between the the British and the American forces. Uh, and just it, it it occurred in June seventeenth, seventeen seventy five, and uh, there's a, a wonderful uh, obelisk just, a, just a jutting up into the sky. So, you know, as you said, from the Lincoln Memorial, you can kind of look out, see the reflecting pool, see the Washington Monument. We both uh, kept our first one uh, obelisk-centric. Uh, I don't know that I've ever been to the Bunker Hill Monument. Uh, but we did, you and I did see it when we visited the USS Constitution together. Really? We did? We saw it then? Yes, yes. You can see it on an island uh, uh, very, very okay. close by. Okay. Um, yes, yes. You can see it very close by. And uh, I believe I pointed to it, and I said, that's the, that's the Bunker Hill Monument. I think I even said, maybe we should go take a walk to it. And you said, let's go get beers. And I said, that's fine. I've been 100 times. Um, that, so that, so, so, so I, you did try to take me to the, the monument, and I just wasn't, uh, I, I wasn't able to do that's it. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Okay, so first stops, uh, you, you've got Lincoln Memorial. I've got the Freedom Trail here in Boston, both hitting on important parts of Amer the American story. What's your second? So... My second is, again, part of the literal American story, and this is in uh, Philadelphia, and uh -huh, okay. it is the National Constitution Center. Mm, good choice. So one thing to flag real quick is that, unfortunately, the National Constitution Center does not actually contain the Constitution. The Constitution, right. right. Like, yeah. it sounds like that's it might. I, I was going to say it because I, I was a little surprised that you chose a place that's named for a thing it doesn't contain. Seems right. like you're you're setting somebody up for disappointment. But I promise that the National Archives building in D.C. is way less fun to visit than the National Constitution Center and will tell you way less about the United States. And in addition, um, it is incredibly close to uh, Independence Hall and Liberty Bell. Mm. So, so I think it sort of combines, you know, uh, you, your first recommendation was Boston. I feel yeah, like, sure. uh, well, it wasn't Boston in general. <laughs> it was the freedom right. trail. That's but true. I understand you're saying I, I've chosen a place that, uh, misrepresents right. itself, but it's in close proximity to places that I rejected, but that are better. Right. So, right. so, sure. so the national constitution center is located, uh, in this area that is, believe it or not, often called America's most historic square mile. So oh, in, it very often I find myself calling it that two, <laughs> three times a week. <laughs> I don't know. I, I feel like if you and I worked at one of the three places that are in the, you know, around in that square mile, we'd probably say it a lot. Sure. You know, I just want to say maybe your, maybe your trail is the most patriotic 2.5 miles, but a uh, square mile here in Philadelphia. Um, so you've got the national constitution center. It was actually uh, opened in, uh, in 2000. So it's not very old. Um, but inside, there is a ton of information, uh, both from a, like a bigger picture perspective and as granular as you want to get about the Constitution, about what happened uh, in Philadelphia around the drafting of the Constitution, the passing of the Constitution. And uh, there's a really fun uh, place, place in the museum where they've sort of recreated in bronze statues um, all the different signers who were debating. So you can, you can kind of walk, you get to walk in this room um, full of all these kind of fantastic life-size statues and, and feel incredibly tall. Um, because let me tell you, the founding fathers were a lot of things. They were not, they were not tall. No, um, small, small men. They were small men. Except for George Washington, who was humongous. Right, and you get the sense of that because he towers over everybody in the bronze. In this but bronze I think he was here. humongous even though, you know, he was like 5'8". And everybody was like, who's that giant man? <laughs> <laughs> I thought he was 6'10". You know, that, that's... Um, yeah, so that that is that is my my second choice. It is the National Constitution Center, and uh, you know, in the vicinity of Independence Hall, and of course the Liberty Bell, which was rung and has a it has a crack in it, and that I totally don't remember the significance of, but I'm sure very vital to the American story. <laughs> <laughs> so I will say I uh, I considered uh, Philadelphia sites. I, I've I've actually done a, a a good visit to Philadelphia just within the last year, and. Um, 
I will say that when I was compete, when I when I was struggling with how, narrowing down a list to just five, uh, none of the Philly sites made mine. Uh, I felt like the the some of the history that you're covering, I felt the Freedom Trail covered off. So my second stop, uh, this is my New York City stop, and it's none other than Lady Liberty, the uh, Statue of Liberty. You went there. I did. I went. I went to the Statue of Liberty because no, no. I, I mean, feel, I mean, you went there. I, I. Oh, you went. You like, went have there. I, like, like, no, have no. I been there? No, like, oh, you went there. You, you said the Statue of Liberty. I considered it as well, obviously, yeah. because yeah, yeah, it, yeah. it is to me. I mean, yeah. uh, to compare, you know, the Liberty Bell, this you know broken bell, to to something as grand as the Statue of Liberty that uh, welcomed generations of immigrants to uh, our shores. Uh, that I, I just feel like there's no comparison. And and also in these politically charged times, you know, I'm sending this person here in 2019 when, when America is so divided. And I want to remind us that uh, America is a place that has traditionally welcomed folks. And right. so uh, I found the, the visit to the Statue of Liberty both uh, very impressive. I mean, just the size of it, the scale, the idea that anybody actually built and shipped this thing and then plunked it on an island and that it still stands. That, that's extraordinary. But it also stands for an ideal that I would like to remind uh, people is at the, at the heart of what America stands for. Right. And I think that uh, one of the stories that I love about the Statue of Liberty is when it was sent, they actually didn't have a base uh, to, to the Statue of Liberty. Do you know this story? No, I don't. What's the, what's the story with that? So uh, when the Statue of Liberty was sent to us, uh, it was it was a massive uh, statue, obviously, and uh, they didn't send a base for it to sit on. Sure. And, the, and you know, America, we're all about that base. Yeah, <laughs> we needed that base. We needed we needed a base to stand Liberty up on. And uh, the richest people in the city in New York City got together and they formed this committee to to actually raise the money uh, for the statue. And they failed. They couldn't do it. Uh, they, they could not uh, raise the amount of money needed, uh, which is a sad thing uh, for American uh, New York businessmen at the time, but they couldn't make it happen. So uh, what happened was reporters picked this up. It was written about in, in some of the great newspapers in the country, and people from all over the country started sending in pennies, nickels, and dimes uh, to this committee. And it was actually through the donations of all the people in the United States, uh, you know, p- people who were not the richest people in New York, but just regular Americans who wanted to see the statue uh, put up in, in their name that, you know, called out to, to, to the less fortunate to come, come to us, uh, was actually built because of these, uh, was actually able to be stood up because of everybody in the country. And I just, I love that story. I, it's a, it's a wonderful story. And of course, uh, I think, uh, nothing sums up America better. And I, I think it might be even worth pausing here to read it. Uh, the poem by Emma Lazarus that, that is on, uh, the Statue of Liberty, uh, and the sonnet is called The New Colossus. Ryan, would you like to hear it? Yes, I'd love to hear it. The New Colossus by Emma Lazarus, not like the brazen giant of Greek fame, with conquering limbs astride from land to land, here at our sea-washed sunset gate shall stand a mighty woman with a torch, whose flame is the imprisoned lightning and her name Mother of Exiles. From her beacon hand glows worldwide welcome. Her mild eyes command the air-bridged harbor that twin cities frame. Keep ancient lands your storied pomp, cries she, with silent lips. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. The wretched refuse of your teeming shore, send these, the homeless, tempest-tossed to me. I lift my lamp besides the golden door. I mean, good God, Ryan, how was the Statue of Liberty not on your list? I be I, because I knew it would be on yours, Kiernan. I have well, faith. you are right. If nothing else, so that I could recite. Yeah. No. I mean, I, I look. I'm watching you. You. I don't even think you read that off anything. I, I think that was just <laughs> that was just in your head. Well, I was reading it off my tattoo of it on my forearm. Ah, uh, yes, yes. It's very in very small print, though. <laughs> yeah, very very small. I have tiny little delicate wrists. Uh, uh, all right, Ryan. Well, we're moving on to three. So so far, uh, you've got the Lincoln Memorial. I've got the Freedom Trail. Uh, you've got the 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 the, you, the Constitution Center uh, with a kind of a sneak attack. You're also hitting uh, Independence Hall and the Liberty Bell. I've got the Statue of Liberty, clearly the best one so far. What is your number three? So this actually plays in really well with the Statue of Liberty, and my number three is Jackson Heights, Queens. Now, oh, you might uh, say, 
Why? Why? Okay, and my answer is going to be Jackson Heights, Queens. Uh, uh, Queens first, Queens is this massive uh, borough in, in New York City with a yeah. population of 2.2 million residents. Mm-hmm. Did you know that almost half of those residents are immigrants? I, did, I actually like, did know that, yeah. Isn't it? It's, yeah. Uh, it's got a distinction of uh, the most languages spoken within a certain number of square miles. It has. Uh, it, it is the most diverse uh, uh, area possibly in the world. Um, in terms of, of, of where people were born. It mm. has a one, one million uh, foreign-born residents. Mm. Um, it is incredibly diverse from, from that perspective, from a language perspective, from a food perspective. Mm. I picked Jackson Heights because it's, sort of, it's sort of representative. It's got a, a big Latino, a big Asian population. Uh, it's, it's, it is, uh, it's got a big uh, a Middle East population. Uh, and and the, the difference in cultures and food and everything and the way that it all comes together I think is actually very unique to the American story. So if you sat somebody who had never been to the United States before into Jackson Heights, Queens, they mm. would have such a perception of us as this, this melting, melting pot. pot. Uh, exactly. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a fantastic pick. I'm, I'm ashamed I didn't think of it. It feels to me like when I went to the Statue of Liberty, uh, I was uh, kind of holding up an ideal. But you've thrown us into the sort of real, true melee of American life. I, I love it. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you. I think that uh, I think that if folks went, they would be uh, impressed by the diversity of what uh, the United States has to offer and and why the United States is made stronger and more interesting and a better place by the uh, the immigrants who come here. So um, Jackson Heights, Queens, and you can't beat the food, really. I mean, you know, it's pretty fantastic. Ryan, my third pick is uh, a great this is the the newest museum in the Smithsonian Network. And it's the National Museum of African-American History and Culture. And, uh, you know, you, of course, mentioned with the Lincoln Memorial, the the sort of civil war and the the legacy of slavery and and the the kind of struggle that America has gone through. And I think this museum um, encompasses, it it tells that story, um, but covers right from uh, when African-Americans began coming to America uh, straight through to the the dynamic and huge cultural impact that the, that they have today, and uh, you know the museum started with with no collection, and and a call went out, sort of like the story you were telling about uh, raising funds for the Statue of Liberty. Uh, calls came out for we need uh, uh, objects, uh, historical objects, to tell the story of African American history and culture in America, and. Uh, uh, Thousands and thousands of objects uh, are, are now housed in this beautiful new building right on the mall uh, in Washington, D.C. And you can see everything from uh, Harriet Tubman's hymnal to Nat Turner's Bible to uh, Louis Armstrong's trumpet to uh, a dress sewn by Rosa Parks. I, I, I mean, it, it, it takes you from uh, it, it takes you through such a so many it takes you through centuries of history and, and really gives you a, a deep connection uh, uh, through it, of, of individual stories through powerful objects. And, and I mean, they have tremendous, and I, I've been as well, uh, and it's incredible. And, you know, one of, the, one of the things about it is that it actually gives you an incredible amount of information. And I, I think with this particular museum, it is important not to have like a lot else planned that day. Yeah, um, yeah, because yeah. it is sort of overwhelming uh, the the scale of the story that it tells about um, the the history of the slave trade in the Americas all the way through to uh, it ends it ends thankfully with Barack Obama it doesn't go to Trump um, so you, you you end on a high note there but it like you said the the individual stories the the the, the stories of very specific areas in the country I, you know I grew up in the eastern shore of Maryland and there were even uh, you know, call outs to, 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 to very specific places that I knew about that I, I, I had grown up around. So I found the whole experience to be really emotional and, um, and devastating. It's a great pick. Here. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> All right. Well, we're getting down to the, the bottom half now here. So the, these, uh, really have, you know, to, to make the cut this far in, we're getting towards the finale. What is your number four? So, America's not all, uh, you know, fireworks and hot dogs, right? No, no, it's not um, uh, just apple pie and right. uh, Mad Magazine. I don't know. But this city, quick- this city that, yeah, this city that I'm dropping right now 
actually uh, has a lot of fireworks and hot dogs. And it's a city that represents, I think, American expansion, uh, American decadence, uh-huh. uh, and Americans' obsession with being entertained. Um, and that's going to be the city of Las Vegas. So you've chosen, you shit on me for the Freedom Trail, and uh, now you have chosen an entire city. As I the have, yeah. Well, as I was shitting on you for the Freedom Trail, I knew that I was yeah. being an yeah, hypocrite yeah, yeah. because eventually I was going to have not one but two cities. And I my mean, that, that's a, it's like so crazy. I mean, the the Freedom Trail is one cohesive experience. Right. You've cho- that's like me saying, oh, I would really suggest that you visit Florida. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's, it's ridiculous. That is not fair. Not fair because. Uh, the city of Las Vegas, uh, better known as the entertainment capital of the world, sure, um, is 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 uh, the only place that I know that you can stand on one corner, uh, see New York, New York, but also see the Eiffel Tower, uh, but but also see uh, Caesar's Palace. Uh, you know, it brings you in to to to, uh, to I think a uniquely weird and and bizarre uh, only in America experience. I challenge you to, to to find a place like Las Vegas that exists anywhere else. Um, because it is, I think, not great uh, <laughs> for a lot of reasons. <laughs> no, it's, uh, but it's, you know, it's garish, it, and uh, yeah. I, I think uh, it does. It's, it, what, what speaks to America more than 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 the garish, loud, yeah, yeah, obnoxious? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Right. 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 In, built in, in the middle of a desert, uh, totally without without thinking about how how is this going to be sustainable? Right. It'll be right. Fine. Yeah. yeah. Never should have been built. Um, right. And and uh, it speaks to kind of the ugly, uh, just endless appetite of American consumerism. I, I think it does get to an important point. I have chosen to focus on a bit more of the America, the, the beautiful, uh, right. in, in my fourth choice. Um, it's actually, it may be the exact opposite of Las Vegas. Really? Yes. I've chosen here. Uh, this is the only, uh, full national park to have made my list. Oh my gosh. You got a national park. Uh, yeah. I, I've chosen <laughs> the entirety. It's actually even bigger than Las Vegas. It's, um, <laughs> Denali National Park. So I, I want you to experience the full uh, vastness of America because I think that's what makes this so unique. I, I, so many times when I'm traveling through the parks, I meet Europeans who will say Americans just don't appreciate the size, the sheer scale of, of America. You, we, we live in these countries that, you know, you drive two hours in any direction, you hit a boundary, uh, soon a, a much harder boundary uh, po- post Brexit. And uh, uh, these were British. <laughs> British people, I should mention, who said this. And uh, so I want you to see this just enormous national park. I mean, it's millions and millions of acres. And uh, it has a single road that drives through it. And and it, it takes eight hours to drive in. And it takes eight hours to drive out. And the the sheer scale is, is so impressive and just uniquely American. And it speaks to that... that, uh, that uh, the desire for expansion and manifest destiny that you were talking about. I mean, we reached all the way to that uh, far uh, icy kingdom of Alaska. I, I think that's a that's a great pick, um, and I think Alaska uh, probably is, is not a state that that many people get to go to when they're visiting the United States for you know only a time or two. Um, well, yeah. this is, this is this is why I made sure that time and money were no object. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, th- this trip we're planning for people is pretty fantastic, but they've already gone to Vegas and they've made a bunch of money from the, the, the tables, and so they're flying out to relax in, in Alaska. Well, and to, to um, perhaps I, I will uh, tip my hand on my fifth pick, because I think it maybe gets to a little bit of the Las Vegasness of the United States, which is my final pick, and this hits that Lincoln Memorial feeling as well, has to be Mount Rushmore. I knew that you were going to do Mount you Rushmore. You got to do Mount Rushmore. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, first of all, I love that it hits a place in the middle of the country. So you're going you're gonna to fly into Rapid City, South Dakota. You're going to make your way. You're going to drive out to Mount Rushmore. And you're going to look up at this uh, beautiful mountain where we have carved the faces of uh, Washington, and Jefferson, Lincoln, and of course, the, the greatest president we've ever had, Theodore Roosevelt. I mean, if you thought oh. I wasn't going to choose a Theodore Roosevelt... Uh, a site you're completely wrong. And uh, I also love there, you, you to to get to Mount Rushmore, you walk through this plaza 
with every state flag. So uh, it's really giving you a, a sense of, uh, you know, the United States coming together to celebrate it. But you, you glance up at these faces and you definitely say to yourself, why the f*** would anyone do this? <laughs> right. Why, why would they carve these enormous faces? And the, and the, uh, the reason was for tourism. They, they did it to give people a reason to come to South Dakota. And that's why I'm sending you my dear friend, to Mount Rushmore. Well, my fifth pick, they needed no reason to, to drive people to, to come there because it's such a fantastic place to visit. But I think it is uniquely American in a lot of ways. And that is the French Quarter in New Orleans. Ooh, I love it. Yeah, I think the French Quarter, um, from its French and Spanish uh, 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 background, along with the, uh, the population that was uh, obviously uh, there and, and born in Louisiana, um, it is incredibly diverse and interesting city uh, that has both a rich historical history. You know, obviously it was uh, uh, became part of the United States in uh, 1803 during the Louisiana Purchase, um, and uh, has had uh, has been uh, has had you know tremendous uh, history, including obviously the uh, Hurricane Katrina, um, which was a, a massive uh, event that that thankfully uh, New Orleans has um, really come back from in in, in, a, in a great way. Um, but I, I would say that New Orleans is one of the few places in the United States, uh, outside of some of our older cities on the East coast that really feel like stepping back in time. Uh, and, and you can, it, it does feel like a different, unique place. And I, I've never been to another place like New Orleans. I don't know if, uh, in the French quarter, I don't know if you have. No. And I, I think too, it, it feels like a particular melding of the sort of Spanish and French and American cultures coming together. And so, uh, you get something that really is uh, unique. And, and I think also because you've gone, uh, you know, kind of across the United States, you brought to Las Vegas and then you're going, I mean, you've really, you, you know, you've really appetite seems to be a major uh, theme across all the ones that you're going. So you're going to want to not eat for a week before you take Ryan's tour of the U S. Um, uh, <laughs> I, I, I think uh, it does speak to the uh, types of cultures that can develop independently in such a large nation. So the French Quarter, also known for, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the birth of, of jazz. And uh, to this day, if you walk around the French Quarter, you hear an incredible amount of live music being played from all these, all these venues. Um, so you're right that you have to go hungry, but you also have to go ready to, to uh, have a few drinks and listen to some uh, fantastic music. Because it's a city that stays up about as late as New York, if not later. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and also, you know, a jazz being a, a quintessentially American musical art form. Actually, it's a shame neither of us uh, got us to a Broadway show. Go see 1776 before you head out on this. Uh, I think this, it's Hamilton. This this to, you know, I, I don't know what that is. Uh, <laughs> no, I, of course, Hamilton. Uh, no, Hamilton's fine, but I'm not sure it's a very accurate representation of uh, of history. No, I don't unlike think. 1776, which yeah. is absolutely <laughs> just very accurate. Also, uh, Ryan, I do want to get, because uh, I allowed you to pitch the Constitution Center, but also loop in uh, the Liberty Bell, something I'd like to just recommend when you go out to Rushmore, I, I would also like you to just take a swing by another competing colossal sculpture uh, built into a mountain, which is called the Crazy Horse Memorial. Have you ever heard of that? I have actually heard of it. Yes, I have. I, I, it's newer though, right? I mean, it's a, it's it, a more it's recent still, It's still uh, being created. It's, yeah. it's been uh, worked on by this family uh, since 1948. And it is a humongous, much bigger than Mount Rushmore, uh, carving into a mountain of uh, a depiction of the Lakota warrior crazy horse. And he's riding a horse and he's sort of pointing off into the distance. And just to give you a sense of the scale, his head alone, so you know, you get a torso, you get a horse, I mean, you get the whole sculpture. His head alone is 87 feet compared to the U.S. presidents that's only 60 feet. And all they are just floating heads. So, uh, you know, I think the sculpture, uh, a befitting uh, tribute to uh, Native American culture is, of course, uh, without whom uh, America wouldn't be here at all. And I think this is a much nicer uh, uh, thing to experience than just looking at the, the passport where they've got that superimposed totem pole. Uh, to represent Native American culture. So this, this, this is something more worthy. Agreed, agreed. And, uh, and you can hit both uh, together. So thank you for letting me slip that in under the, uh, under the radar. So maybe if we could just give uh, one last time, each of our lists in total, uh, I've got the Freedom Trail, the Statue of Liberty, 
the National Museum of African American History and Sculpture, Denali National Park, and Mount Rushmore. And I've got the Lincoln Memorial, which is, I think, the most important thing you've learned about today. Uh, The National Constitution Center, Jackson Heights, Queens, Las Vegas, Nevada, and the French Quarter in New Orleans. I I love where these lists came out. I think maybe every year we got to do this, but we're not allowed to repeat from the previous year. So um, I, I, we're also going to invite our listeners. Listen, I, this is a great, very fun uh, challenge for those who love to travel. Feel free to, to write your own. What five places would you send a visitor to quintessentially show them the story of America? What captures it for you? And we've tried to cover a lot of historical and cultural aspects. Um, and, and feel free to share them with us. Maybe we'll feature a couple of the best ones on the show. Outofofficepod at gmail.com. Uh, Ryan, uh, With that, I think it's time for the last stop. The last stop. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the last stop on this train. Everyone, please leave the train. Kiernan, it is the best segment, the people segment, uh, the last stop. Tell us what it's all about since you do it better than I do. (laughs) (laughs) All right, Ryan. Ryan, we're here in the last stop. And, you know, we got to hurry through. We got barbecues to get to, we've got uh, hot dogs to eat. And, uh, so the last stop is the last segment of the the last segment of the show. Uh, your favorite segment, my favorite segment, the people segment. It's uh, the moment in the show where you and I each share one thing that we've uh, experienced. We've maybe we've eaten it, maybe we've smelt it, maybe we've cooked it, maybe it's something we we've done or or we've driven past or we've overheard, and uh, it fed that spirit of wanderlust in us even during the workaday week. So, Ryan, what bit of travel inspiration do you have for us this week? So, I've been going to D.C. Uh, quite a bit lately for work, and uh, I've been away from my f- favorite Brooklyn natural wine spot that oh. I've covered <laughs> at length. Yeah. Uh, we'll well, link to it in the show notes. Yeah, absolutely. The, the old episode, a great episode all about natural wines. You were ahead of the curve on natural wines, though, because I'm seeing Bon Appetit wa- right up about, nat- uh, about natural wines. You are you were talking about it before it was a thing. I'm a trend center. You know, I was like, natural wines are where it's at. And then, you know, uh, six months later, you know, Vanity Fair is asking me about it. So it, it we, we are... Uh, I'm not sure that's what you were <laughs> quoted about in Vanity Fair. I don't know why I said Vanity Fair. Because uh, you were recently featured in Vanity Fair for a different reason, though. Yeah. I will tell you, Ryan, I had uh, some people reach out to me and say, this isn't the Ryan Davis on your podcast, is it? No. And I said, it is. It is that Ryan, I, that that very Ryan Davis. Well, that is, I tried to get Vanity Fair to give the pot a mention. You know, I'll tell was, you what, we'll link to the article in the show notes. Oh, we should. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I've been in D.C., and, and when folks read the article, they'll, they'll understand why. Um, but uh, I've been looking, I've been missing my uh, local natural wine spot. So I've got two fantastic recommendations. Um, the first is a wine bar, uh, called the Dio wine bar. And it's only been open for a little over a year, uh, but they've got some of my favorite, uh, natural wine. Uh, uh, they've got some of my favorite natural wine brands. They've got, they've got your beachy, uh, they've got everything you need there. They've got a fantastic sort of small plates menu. Um, I really would recommend uh, the grilled cheese if you're if you're into that sort of thing. It's it's lovely. Does it pair well with the natural wines? It depends. You know, I mean, <laughs> I, I I only drink reds really, but uh, you know, it does it does. It, it, I mean, it, you know, they've got they've got a really kind of kooky pour list, so there's a lot of fun things they can pour you. And and with the small plates, I you know, I think it's a it's a lovely evening out in the town. Um, but when you finish up, DC closes early. You know, um, when you, if you want to need to grab another bottle of wine to take back to the hotel. There is a brand new, gorgeous wine shot called Domestique Wine. Called what? And Domestique. Okay. And uh, Domestique Wine is uh, a natural wine only shop in in DC. It is the one of the. I, it is a. If it was in New York, it would be. It would rival Henry's as one of my favorite places to go. Um, and it is absolutely lovely. Uh, and they have all sorts of wine tastings and events there that you can uh, you know check out. Um, and I think between Dio Rhine Wine Bar and Domestique, the wine store, uh, you know, folks who are in D.C. can get their natural wine fill uh, like I am. And you'll probably see me there at Dio on any random night because uh, it's become one of my, my go-to spots in the city. 
My, my. Natural wine in D.C. I mean, if natural wine has made it to D.C. already, then, then natural wine's over. I, You know, what, is, what's next? Yeah, the Trump Tower is not serving natural wine, I promise. Uh, Trump, yeah. you know, Trump brand wine is doing anything but natural, you know. Well, uh, mine all, my last stop this week also relates to some recent travel. Uh, Catherine and I recently uh, spent a weekend in Toronto for a wedding. And, uh, you know, as I always encourage folks to do, if you've got to travel for work or, or a family obligation or something like a wedding, you know, you got to try to to fit in some time to to wander and explore that city. And I'll tell you, Catherine and I have really come to realize how much we like Toronto. Toronto is very cool. And uh, we were staying at an Airbnb that was right by Queen Street. And Queen Street is this wonderful uh, 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 avenue that you can wander up and down with cafes and design shops. And, uh, I, you know, I'm sure there's a natural wine store if I, I if I had to guess. I mean, if it's in D.C., it's got to be in Canada, right? Yeah. Mon- Montreal and Toronto, I'm sure, have really great uh, uh, natural wine scenes. And uh, it just we we both realize that we've neglected exploration of Toronto uh, because it seems uh, so close at hand. Very quick flight to get there. And, uh, and also we have only gone when we have weddings, we've been to several weddings in Toronto and I I've decided I'm not just going to squeeze in, uh, you know, visits to the natural history museum, which by the way, been to can highly recommend the great natural history museum in Toronto. We need to, to have a, uh, a weekend specific weekend away, three day weekend out in Toronto. Uh, it seems so close at hand. I'm overlooking it, but you got to be a local tourist. So, uh, we're going to be booking a, a trip there, uh, a lot longer soon yeah i i think toronto is fantastic um we should do a whole episode on toronto because there would be a lot to cover and it would be a lot of fun i just feel like people don't realize how cool it is it's very cool i think canada is awesome i mean also know. cool about toronto is they have uh, an airport on toronto island oh and my gosh do you know this well the only because our mutual friend Rich is obsessed with this fact. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, the, if you, I mean, we would have him on the pod. He would talk about those two airports until they, and you know, we'd well, have to cut I, a they, lot of it. They rightfully uh, deserve credit. So this Toronto Island Airport, the only airline that flies in and out of it is Porter Air. You and, flew uh, Porter, didn't you? I, of course, I flew Porter. Oh, uh, you because your other guys are out of business. You're <laughs> wow. Like, yeah, what? there was no, <laughs> there was no Wow flight available, and so uh, we took Porter. It's interesting you say that though, because Porter, Porter and Wow are very similar. Okay, but Porter used to be quite a premium experience, right. but I will say they have gone down market. I, I, I noticed. Uh, we'll, we'll cover uh, Porter Air uh, uh, more closely. It makes, in a it makes me episode. so happy that you have now you have now flown Porter Air. You can add this to your list of uh, I, I, I favorite flew brands. Porter back when Porter was Porter. I must say right. I, I was disappointed, but you can't beat the fact that you can fly in and you can be in cool, hip, uh, ready to hang out in Toronto in literally five minutes because it is, you land on this island and then it's just zip. You can either take a ferry or you can walk a tunnel and you are right in the city. You compare that to flying into New York City. You know, the, the your flight might be three hours. Then you have eight hours of traffic oh gosh, to make it days. to Manhattan or Brooklyn. You know, I have not uh, flown to, in. To, to make it into Manhattan. Yeah. You know, I have not flown into this 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 airport, uh, but being able to walk into the city, that sort of reminds me of how close DCA is when uh, when you fly into DC. It's like a six minute ride. You're in yeah, exactly, downtown DC. Exactly. Yeah. There's a ton to be said for that. Yeah. And uh, any any urban planners that are listening, as you're planning out a new city, put that airport just just right in the center. <laughs> I, I want to be like looking into people's apartments as I'm coming down. But look, folks, if you fly into LaGuardia, no better time to take a little stopover in Jackson Heights and uh, you know ha- check it out because you're you're going through there anyway. Absolutely. Well, uh, Kieran. What are we talking about next week? Oh, Ryan, I got a real humdinger interview for us next week. Are you ready? Oh, I think I've, I think I've heard tell of this. What, okay, what, so what's there, the there's this book, this travel book that I read long ago, and it's been stuck in my head for years. And uh, the title's a pun. I forgive it that, but it's called Room with a Pew, P-E-W. Room with a Pew, Sleeping Our Way Through Spain's Ancient Monasteries. It's by uh, two authors, a book by Miriam Murcutt and Richard Starks. And uh, what this couple did was they took a road trip through Spain where they only stayed at monasteries and convents that this is offer like your, rooms and visitors. This is like your dream. It's like it, your it's, dream vacation. It's a dream vacation. It's, it's, it's gonna, we're going to Catholic it up real nice. Oh, good, good. Um, and, and, and we're going to talk about how you, too, could plan a road trip through Spain staying only 
at monasteries and convents. Super fascinating, a really fun book and a fun interview. Well, I can't wait to, to, to meet them. It seems like a, it's going to be a good time. Until then, I'm Ryan Davis. And I'm Kiernan Schmidt. And this is Out of Office, a travel podcast. The seat taken. What's your favorite patriotic song? My favorite patriotic song? Oh, God. What, what's your favorite patriotic this, song? This, this, this land is your land. This land is mine. Absolutely. Really? Absolutely. I, I love that song. I think it speaks to the, the spirit of the national park system. This land is your land. This land is mine. Mine is the Battle Hymn of the Republic. Uh, I, I, no, I listen to that really? song so... Oh my gosh, so many times. Oh, yeah. I didn't expect it at all. I love the Battle Hymn. It's a great Civil War song. Give me a few bars. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are sort. Even a wine reference there. You know? <laughs> we're na- if only it said we're natural wine. Well, well I mean, it was natural <laughs> wine then, right? <laughs>